Welcome to Stageworthy. I'm your host, Adriana Prosser. I've hijacked Stageworthy this week to talk to Phil Rickaby in celebration of the one-year anniversary of this, the Stageworthy podcast. Phil is a playwright and performer, as well as the host of this podcast. You can find Stageworthy on Facebook and Twitter at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website at stageworthypodcast.com. If you enjoy the podcast, I hope you'll subscribe on iTunes or Google Music or whatever podcast app you use, and consider leaving a comment or rating. Welcome to Stage Worthy Podcast. <laughs> this is your guest host, Adriana Prosser. Uh, because I have flipped the table on Phil Rickaby, we are putting him in the hot seat. So, hello, Phil. Uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel to be on the other side of this? It's a little weird. It's a little weird. I did I did one interview previously with uh, The Inadequate Life. I don't know if he's... Uh, as of today, in uh, the end of November, he hasn't put that one up yet. But um, And that was really weird. I had to... Tell, like I, I sort of sat down and was like, okay, so remember, Phil, you're not doing the interviewing. So let him, you know, I just was like, okay, so I'm not the one asking the questions. I'm just answering them. So I'll try to remember that. Try to remember that here. Well, I mean, this is this is also your baby. We're going to talk about the fact that this is your baby. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it can be more conversational rather than like straight up interview well, question that, I mean, that's I mean, I, that's always my preference Yeah. When I'm when I'm doing these things is to have... A conversation. The best, the best interviews are the ones where I don't have to do anything at all, where I can like start somebody talking and then they'll just go. Excellent. Well, so hopefully, hopefully I can. Let's try for that. Let's try for that. I uh, make my I, life a little easier. <coughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, well, let's let's start with the obvious question mm-hmm. then. Uh, Stage worthy podcast. Where where did that uh, brain baby happen? Um. So I. So I guess I'm gonna. I'll, I will go back to there were a couple, when I first discovered podcasts uh, a few years ago uh, there were a couple of podcasts that I started listening to one was uh, the Nerdist podcast um, and the other one was uh, Downstage Center which was put out by uh, the American Theatre Wing and was hosted by Howard Sherman at the time and Howard Sherman would sit down with somebody who worked in, in, on, in New York theatre and he would talk to people who were actors, directors Producers, designers, stage managers, it didn't really matter who they were. He would sit down with them and he'd, he'd have a conversation with them. And I found that the conversation is really fascinating. Uh, and uh, um, occasionally there'd be like a Canadian voice. I remember uh, who was on. It was one of the, one of the, the guys, oh, it was Stephen We Met was on. Oh, cool. <clears throat> Excuse me, because Stephen Stephen Wimet was in New York doing doing a show, and I was like, I was like Canadian voice, you know, because it was like you know we're Canadian, so we we're always like oh Canadian on an American thing, but yeah, I was so yeah. proud of represent, course, absolutely represent, and we I, it, it was like so um, refreshing to hear like a Canadian perspective, and it wasn't that he was saying anything that was particularly un- unusual. It was just nice to hear a Canadian voice. And I was thinking about how we don't hear those so often. Like, Mm. in Canadian theater, people who get interviewed are pretty rare. So if you're you're leading in a show, you might have an interview, but it's probably going to be print. And maybe if you're on TV, like a TV spot or something, but that's going to be like two minutes of something. So we never have, like, long-form conversations, and we never have... And most people never get interviewed at all. Um, and I thought that there were so many stories in Canadian theater that would be um, interesting to hear. And so I started a, a podcast uh, a few years ago, and I called it Offstage. Um, and I started into that, and then I discovered that there was already another podcast called Offstage. It was an American co- uh, podcast about comedy, and so we were confusing things. Mm. So I came up with another name, uh, which was... Uh, I, the name is escaping me right now. But eventually, I I sort of didn't do the smart thing, which was bank a bunch of episodes. I didn't put like 
all the effort into to just like do episode after episode after episode, like try for two a week or something. And I got to a point where I was like, every week, um, who am I going to interview this week? And that got, yeah, you're making a face. And that's like, <laughs> that that is like, like it was order. like the most stressful thing was like every week being like, who, okay, so who can I interview this week? And eventually it just like, I got too tired of that. Yeah, that's exhausting. And then I decided last year, well, a little over la- a little more than a year ago, um, that I wanted to do another one. Because again, I, I like the, the idea and I feel like it's, the Canadian theater world is an underserved demographic in terms of uh, the the voices and the stories and the interviews. And so, and there's certainly enough enough material. There's enough people who are uh, interest who who are doing stuff. And I love the idea of being a, a theater booster, somebody who is pro theater, who like likes to have the stories told and things like that. So. Um, I started putting together another podcast and started approaching people that I thought would be interesting. And this time I did it a little, a little smarter. And uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I banked a bunch of episodes before I started. And <laughs> you I, learned. I learned, and because I had initially done that, I was like, I got four in the bank, I'll go. And then I just sort of was like, I'll go four in the bank. And then suddenly the four were gone, and I was like, well, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now I've been. Uh, a lot more careful about making sure that like scheduling. And so I know in advance whose episodes are going up when, and when I'm running out of content and I need to start, uh, uh, soliciting people. That's good. Um, so, I mean, that was the, that was really the, the, the start of it. And, um, I've been really thankful for the people who, who have come on Mm -hmm. and it's, it's taught me a lot about, um, uh, about theater, like being able to talk to, to people who do different things. And you've had people other than actors, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I've talked to stage managers, and I've talked to... Uh, I've had a choreographer on, and uh, a couple of artistic directors, and people who've directed shows, playwrights. Um, and it, it's funny because, you know, I, I know a lot of people, and I approach all of... Like, everybody, I'm like, oh, this person does theater, I should have them on. And so I approach everybody, and then occasionally it's like, I should ask somebody that I don't know. Yeah. And one of the things that's challenged for me is the fact that I'm not comfortable asking people, like, like talking to people is like, we have dog trauma. Um, <laughs> talking to people, like walking up to people and like starting a thing is like, that's like where my social anxiety kicks in. Right. And so like the idea of like emailing somebody that I don't know who might be Ooh. like a, uh, like a name, like somebody who's like important, quote, like whatever, you know, an art, like that whole, like, it, they can only say no. Doesn't right. really apply oh, yeah. to your brain. But you know, of you course it is. Freak you still freak out. Like that's exactly it. Like the worst that happens is that they say no. And almost nobody, nobody has said no. There you go. But there's still that, Oh my God, I'm not important enough to talk to so-and-so. Psh. And we're, no, and and this is where that dynamic of like the Canadian voice, I think, comes in. <laughs> You're just being too darn polite, and and I, do you feel like, you know, correct me if 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 I'm way off base, but for my own part, witnessing and being a part of and whatever flux that might be in, um, there is no celebrity system in place in Canada. And if there is, it's very faint. Mm -hmm. I think we recognize people who have been in the business for a while Mm -hmm. and that we also recognize people who have celebratory credits like, oh, wow, they did a blockbuster. Oh, wow, they've been doing Stratford for 10 years. But I also feel like we wouldn't... Like, those people wouldn't get mauled on the street. No, no. Those people shouldn't fear to go to their grocery store. Oh, they don't, because we don't we don't have, like you say, we don't have celebrities. Yeah. But the thing that also makes that more difficult is a lot of like, celebrities have, like, their people. And so you could contact their manager. Oh, and, I see. you know, talk to them or whatever. Now, one thing that's been fortunate for me is that, you know, I'm on a few media lists. So some of the interviews are coming to me. A little more easier now, so yeah, that's excellent. and that's that that makes finding people a little bit more a little bit easier. But I don't just want to talk to people when they have a project coming up. Yeah. So there are convers. I don't want to be like okay, so we, because you have a, co- a project now, we're going to talk about that project for a little while. I would I love 
sitting out, down and talking to people more generally. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's the kind of thing where you have to sort of just uh, uh, um, like ask them, like find out how to contact them and, and, and be like, like I'm, I'm asking you a question now. Um, like, can you, could you do this? And then you have to track them down and that sort of thing. And, and, and people do are a little bit flaky sometimes. Artists. <laughs> I know. I mean, that's the that's I the mean, thing, right? There's that. I mean, you've got the whole the whole flake. I mean, I've had people who are like, "Yes, I would love to," and I'm like, "All right, let's set a date." And they say, and then go they go radio silent, and I'm like, "Okay, okay." Yeah, that might be why you need those people. Well, that those people would be like, "Okay, I'm scheduling this, and you're going to be there on this date," and then they show up, and we get together, and that's one of the things that like when I'm dealing with somebody who where there's a publicist or something like that mm. that publicist makes the appointment they say this person is free then you're going to be at this place at this time and that person shows up rather yeah. than, than having any kind of back and forth that's interesting so a lot of the time um, just translating what you're saying is that we as as Torontonians Ontarians Canadians take it as you will because you've, you've interviewed people elsewhere yeah, 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 Toronto. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. Toronto is your home base that's my home base so that's where I have the most mm-hmm. contacts and it becomes a little like really easy to talk to people uh, yeah. but I've talked to people uh, all over Canada um, <clears throat> so that that so that I don't have to I don't want it to just be a thing where I just talk to people from Toronto I want it to be more Fair enough. Stuff. And then, do you find that people who <clears throat> who are traveling through Toronto have been giving you the time of day? Oh, uh, sometimes. That's sometimes. Cool. Like if I can get a hold of them. Like I, 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 preferably, I love to sit down with somebody and talk to them in person. That's yeah. That's far easier than than talking to somebody remotely or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but you know, on the topic of, of people, like of people who who um, you know, we say yeah, they say I'd love to be on the show, and then and then we 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 aren't able to connect. I think that comes from people not being used to uh, being interviewed. Well, there's that too. Because, you know, I mean, you talk to most people in in Canadian theater, and the most they get as an interview is maybe some emailed questions that they then have to answer quickly, and then those get printed in a newspaper. We don't get... We don't, we don't, that was, that was, there was audio on that the was, photograph you were taking. That was me trying to be stealthy and completely <coughs> did, failing. That, did not work. <laughs> Watch for that photo on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of, so, so we're not used to it. Like we don't get interviewed. So I think it's maybe not so surprising that people just don't quite know how to, how to deal with it. I was trying to get to this point earlier and then I was distracted by the fact that you have been elsewhere in Toronto. So let's put a pin mm-hmm. in that, that your travels. But I also feel like... Are, can we make a mass generalization of Canadians saying that we have a big fault in how we project ourselves? Like we're very en masse. Are we too humble? Are we too reserved? Are we too polite to be to to like shout from the rooftops how awesome we are? Not I, just our projects. Absolutely, absolutely. The number of people who who their their initial reaction when I ask them if they come on the podcast is. Oh, there's no way I could talk about myself for an hour. Mm-hmm. And I'm always like, oh, no, you're not going to have a problem. Yeah. You won't yeah. have a – it's easy. <clears throat> First off, I mean, once you get started, I mean, it's just a conversation. It's a conversation that's recorded. Yeah. But, I mean, and that – that it's it's funny because everybody think like, oh, like I think 70% of the people that I've approached, they're like, no, I, there's no way that I could talk about myself for an hour. Yeah. And I think that is that Canadian, like, oh, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to draw attention to myself. Yeah. Um, which is a strange thing. Like, how do we sell the stuff that we make if we don't? Yeah, self promotion is a, is a thing that is overlooked a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, not to talk about myself, but being mm-hmm. in social media and marketing, mm-hmm. a lot of the time, it really is building your network yeah. and, and tooting your own horn. Absolutely, and it is. Knowing how to do that. Yeah. And it's 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 one of those things where you know if it, it it's hard enough to get noticed. There's yeah. somebody you know, and there aren't enough people who 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 actually want to give a voice to just about anybody. Like you know, if you're talking about news print, like print media and stuff like that, they're worried about selling newspapers mm-hmm. and things like that. So they want their con they need their content to be. <clears throat> um, they need to have somebody who has a name or there's a project that's interesting that somebody is talking about. And I'm really just interested in like the people and their stories. Which is amazing because I feel like 
giving them another tool to express themselves, right, beyond projects, yeah. and also giving them a platform where they feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, I think that, that that might be why you don't have people beaten down in your door yet, mm -hmm. because they think that it has to be, like, all this scripted <clears throat> PR and buzzwords and whatnot, and they get intimidated. Oh, yeah. And they, a lot of people are like, oh, I'll, I'll come to you when, when I have a project. And I'm like, you don't have to do that. Yeah. We all have plenty to talk about. Yeah. And... When you have a project, we can talk about that too. Because, yeah. like, there is no rule that says that once you're on once, like, Sex T Rex has been on twice, and I'm sure that soon we'll have like a three peat. And, like, I'll have people back on all the time. Like, yeah, no, it's <clears> perfect. <throat> and the thing is, is that we don't stop being artists when we don't have a project. And I think well, that's that, the that is that is a the very big <clears throat> issue for actors and artists mm -hmm. and performers. And that if they don't have something, then they are not present, that yeah. they are not. If they're not doing, then they not then they are not. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. This, this yeah. weird sentence that I can't it's like, necessarily. It's form. like it's like if I don't have a project, then mm. I'm not worthy of being spoken to. Which is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And or like the, the conundrum that most all of us creators come to is that if we are in between projects, mm -hmm. then we have this like holding spell over us of like I don't know I don't know what to do with myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know yeah. who, who am I? What am I doing? Yeah. And that the other thing is is that when people come up to you as a creator, that they're like, so what are you working on? Oh fuck, that is my least favorite question because. I get so super awkward when people do yeah, that. Yeah, and yeah, And I'm sure that, that you do. I'm sure lots of people do. Is like if you don't have a project that you are like working on right now or something that's like concrete that's not like, oh, this show opens in a month or whatever. Yeah. That somebody's like, uh, well, I've, I've got, a, 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 you know, you just sort of go like. You get really <clears throat> awkward. Yeah. Long in the tooth. But, uh, but what's worse too is the I don't know what to say I don't really have anything but then the ex the other extreme of like well I've got like these 10 projects that are up in the air and like it's really hard to excuse my phrasing explain that to a muggle yeah 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 I know where it's just like irons are in the fire and that's okay too I can't give you a solid yeah. product I can't give you a solid date mm -hmm. but I have so many things that I'm working on and that's good too the other thing that I think that people don't realize is when you know if you have your day job and you know work, I, like I work with people who are non-theater people although you know, as as the company grows, I'm finding there's more theater people who are joining joining the company I work for. Um, you know, people will say, "So what? Are you, like, they're what are you working on?" It's because they're genuinely genuinely interested. Yeah. It's not like there's that perception I think that we have as performers. There's that whole schmooze thing. So what are you working on? Yeah, and then, yeah. You know, I bullshit for a while, and then I'll ask you, and you'll bullshit for a while, and mm. you know, we'll talk about how awesome and important we are, <laughs> and then. And I think that makes us awkward, but then there's those people who they're asking because they're, they are actually interested in what we're working on. And want to show that they're being supportive. Like Absolutely, that they've, yeah. they've heard of you doing something in the past yeah. or that, yeah, they just want to be supportive. Yeah. So it's not, it's not always a negative um, for people to be like, so what do you do? No, no. But I think that, that, that after, after a little while, after being in the, you know, in the industry for a little while, that's our perception of that question. I think so. Because we, we hear that question if we're at like some kind of, party or schmooze fest or like some reception after an opening or whatever it is if you yeah. happen to be at an opening or whatever or like at the fringe tent mm, which is like big i always you know the funny thing is the fringe tent when i don't have a show in the fringe i always feel awkward being at the fringe tent because <laughs> it's like i feel like oh i don't have a show to promote and i don't know what i'm doing here you know <laughs> it's like so the people are like, "What are you working on?" I'm like, "Uh, nothing, nothing for French. I don't know what I'm um, here to yeah. see you. I'm here to see your show. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's weird. It it shouldn't be because you could just be like, "Wow, I I have the free time and I want to be here for you." Yeah, exactly. What are you like? What do you want me to see? What 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 are you seeing right yeah. now? What's good? Yeah, it's it's one of those funny things that that I think that we've learned that that question is loaded when it doesn't have to be. Absolutely. I think, yeah, I think that there's definitely some some baggage that is not due. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go back to that whole thing that you you get around. You get around with, with the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, what do you mean I get around with a podcast? Well, I mean, like, you're not just, your home base is Toronto. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would think that there would be, like, it would be very difficult for you to interview anybody who's not a Torontonian. Um. That's true. It's like I can't if I'm traveling, I will try to find somebody. Um, like if I'm if I was to go to Edmonton, I would be like, okay, so I'm gonna be in Edmonton. Who do I like who can I talk to? Um, but um, there are ways to do it. There's a, a like I use something called Zencaster, which just came out of beta, which 
Uh, basically, it works like a web-based Skype that I can record. So oh, neat. it'll record their part of the conversation, and I'll record it records my part of the conversation, and then it stitches them together so it forms one audio file. So I don't have to do a whole lot of a whole lot of stuff that way. That's cool. So that simplifies that whole process a little bit because um, obviously I don't have a budget because I this the podcast doesn't make money yet. It's, you know, I, I don't have any illusions. My podcast is a Canadian-focused podcast, and um, it's hard to make money that way. And, and I have a very niche market. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't have a general interest thing. I'm not talking about pop culture, and I'm not talking about, about uh, the news or whatever. I'm talking to theater people. And the people that are most interested in that are other theater people or people who like theater. And so um, that's a smaller demographic. So I don't... I'm not in this to get sponsors or to make money. Believe me, I would love to have somebody come along to cover my costs because there are there are costs to this. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> there's like there's hosting costs and there's like there are other costs and there's software that I've purchased and things like that to to do this sort of thing. And but I don't I don't think it's not I don't think it could possibly be a thing that makes me money. Hmm. I mean that would be nice, but I think that the demographic is is small enough that 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 I. I would be overjoyed if it happened, but I would not be... Uh, that's not what's going to make not, you feel like a no, success. No, exactly, exactly. Well, that's good because that's also the theater world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, absolutely. If you're in this for the money, you get out, get out yeah, now. that's right. I mean, the thing is that like, I've approached people. Occasionally, I will, I will like, solicit on Twitter to say, I want to talk to people who are not from uh, Toronto, not from Ontario, and I'll try to get the Twitter network and my uh, Facebook network to suggest people to me um, who are willing to, to or interested in talking and so I, I find people that way and then we'll use the uh, Zencaster or, or whatever software to, to record the conversation very cool yeah well and then what uh, like on that are there any other uh, networks that you're exploring mm-hmm. as to how to get the word out because I, I feel like <clears throat> the other thing that that is I don't know, the, a barrier mm-hmm. is the fact that your network goes so far yes. and you have to yeah. piggyback on other networks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully people who are listening to this podcast can suggest some networks that like a Facebook group yeah. or a Twitter hashtag or like, what, where have you well, been? The funny thing is, is that when it comes down to that, I'm about as bad as the people who, who only want to talk about like the, <laughs> like who, who don't like want to, because I, I'm very bad at like tooting my own horn. Right. Um, and that's it. That's something that I need to, I definitely need to work on. But, um, the most successful thing is when people are interviewed and they share the episode. Now, maybe, mm. you know, for the most part, uh, people who are their friends or who know them or are following them, they listen to that episode and maybe they don't subscribe. Um, but there are always people who, there are people who will. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the, the main things. So I always like look forward to when, when people, uh, my least favorite thing is when somebody doesn't tweet that they're on the show because I can see the numbers. That's that's because nobody the the person didn't share it with their network. But I wonder mm. why they wouldn't though. Wouldn't that be exactly what they're doing it for? I don't. I don't know. It's not a question that I've asked. So huh. it's it's kind of weird when people don't because I mean, I think that you know it's all part of self promotion. They're not. They're not really. They're not doing me a favor by having the conversation. They're really doing themselves. I mean, they're doing me a favor because I've committed to doing this every week. Yeah. And I just I want I need content, but they're not. Um, like they're 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 not promoting themselves when they don't do that. I think maybe it, it might be that inferiority thing where they're like, I don't feel like it's a thing that I you know I no one else listen to me. It's so strange. <clears throat> it is strange. It is strange. What do you ask your guests? To like, what what what's the pitch? What how do you get people on? Oh, you, say you know the thing is that I don't I don't re- like usually I just I introduce myself as I am Phil. I uh, host a uh, podcast called Stageworthy. Um, it's a podcast where I talk to people in Canadian theater, and I'd love to talk to you. And that's usually all I say. <laughs> now sometimes it's just because I'm it's it has to be short because I'm contacting them via Twitter, so I only have 140 characters, right. but. Um, and nobody has ever said, oh, well, what's your listenership? You know, nobody's ever like, you know, are you big enough? Yeah, you know, like a media kid. No, everybody's like, everybody's like, uh, sure. People are usually, usually very, like, they're willing to do it and they don't need much prompting. 
I think there's a bit of a bit of you know flattery. Oh, somebody wants to talk to me, which might might be one of those things as well. Well, that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, well, on, on behalf of all creators, thank you for giving us a platform because, like, this is this this is a gift. Yeah, and it's true. I feel like um, as Canadians, we import a lot of our culture mm-hmm. from around us, which it's not bad, it's not good, but it happens. Yeah. Um, but it's nice to hear our voice. That's for well, that, sure. I mean, that's that's kind of the my whole the whole thing is is I I, I knew that I wasn't hearing those voices. Like, if you look through. If you were to go on iTunes and search for theater podcasts, you're probably going to find a lot. If you can find any, you're going to find a lot that are from the U.S. Mm -hmm. And there's a few that are popping up in Canada that are, there's a couple that are, uh, like, we do, like, they're doing, like, a reading of a play. And so they read the play over the podcast. And that's... So it's like a radio play, not a podcast, really. Yeah, well, it is. It's a pod, because you download it as a podcast, but that's... Um, uh, but they're reading plays. They're reading like new plays, things like that, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know that there's there's many other things quite like this. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, so now let's let's move into talking about you as a creator. Okay. And and your ties to theater. So I I call myself I call myself a creator as mm-hmm. well as as you've heard so yeah. far because I just I don't wear just one hat. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, what would be like? What is your little Twitter bio? Um, my okay, my Twitter bio is like uh, uh, actor, writer, geek, because um, I think that covers most of the things that I'm sort of that that I do or that I like. Um, if I talk about uh, in a little more depth, um, I, I might refer to myself as a slash uh, uh, actor slash slash playwright. Um, performer slash play like it always like there's always like more than one thing mm-hmm. and uh, I guess I, you know I can add producer to that which is always one of those things that I I sort of discount for myself oh yeah I did a thing at French you know it's like I was yeah. sort of, you know and it's not a thing which is you know that Canadian thing where I don't we don't like talk about our successes all that much. we diminish yeah, yeah. oh I'm, I'm the king of diminishing <laughs> as far as that's concerned um, so it, it becomes like um, uh, so I would say that I'm a I'm a, a, a performer slash playwright. Cool. And yeah. so tell us about the things that you have been working on as a playwright. Um, so as playwright, so I worked on a, a solo play for uh, about eight years called The Commandment, um, which I I performed this summer at the Hamilton Fringe and hopefully will perform again this summer. Um, <clears throat> and. Um, it's not the first thing I've written, but it's it's one of those things that that like I wrote it for eight years because I wasn't ready to to perform it. Like I was, there's a lot of personal stuff that I was like, I don't know if I'm ready to, to put this out there. Um, and also, a solo play is really stressful to perform. Like mm. it is, it's all on you. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's entirely you. And it's like if they don't like it, it's not like if you're doing a play by somebody else, then you know they don't like it. Well, it's not my play. Yeah. Or they don't like my, you know, there's like so many things that they, they can go into it. But when it's a, pl- a solo play that you wrote, it's just you. And so if they don't like it, they don't like your acting, they don't like your performance, they don't like your writing, they don't like you. So it's very oh. stressful, you know, it's like, yeah. It's really easy to take it personally. Oh, absolutely. It's really easy to take it personally. Because, I mean, I don't think if they didn't like it, they don't like you. Yeah. Well, no. But, but that's how it feels. That's how it feels, right? Because it's like this thing that you made. Yeah. Um, so there was that. Um, I've been working for several years also with, with Keystone Theatre um, uh, and we perform plays in the style of silent film and I we're, we usually uh, uh, create collectively hmm. for that so like we come up with a, co- a concept and we might have a uh, uh, an outline um, and we create characters and then we try to like create a story around them um, so but everybody does a little bit of everything. Everybody does a little bit of everything. I'm trying, actually, just I'm experimenting with like writing in the like a play that will be to be performed as a, a silent, a silent. I don't know how that's going to work quite yet, oh. but I'm trying to like write a script that could be a silent, uh, a play in the style of silent film, which would be a, a complete departure for the way that we usually work. Wow, very cool. Um, I got a couple of other uh, plays that I'm sort of in process of editing right now. 
Any um, tidbits that you can tell us? Um, well, I mean, none of them have any kind of performance. There's one called The Heist. Um, actually, a bunch of the ones that I'm working on right now are all uh, ones that were initially written at the Red Sand Castle's uh, Thousand Monkeys Playwriting Festival, which is uh, what just had its fourth year in August. Oh, neat. Um, where we, you know, a bunch of playwrights show up at the Red Sand Castle Theater in Toronto and uh, we, Rosemary gives us three words. Everybody gets random three words, and so we show up, and she starts flipping through a dictionary, and you put your finger on the page, and that's your first word, and you do that again two more times. And then you sit down, and you write a play in, in 24 hours, and then everybody goes home and sleeps, and then the next two days of that long weekend, um, we we read them. Wow. The ones that we wrote. So, so it's bing, bang, you got to play. you got to play. And you, you figure out really quickly if there's... Is, if, is there anything there? Because when it's red, you'd be like, oh, you know, you know that you were kind of uh, exhausted hmm. and sleep depth when you wrote it. More so of an it's, exercise. It's really more of an exercise, but you really get a sense of, oh, there's something here I can build on. And so there are a couple of plays that I, I've written over the last four years that I'm, I'm expanding on. That's neat. Um, I'm going to pry and ask, was The Parliamentarians one of those? Yes, yes. The, the Parliamentarians was actually the first play that I've written in um, oh my god that long? like a, a, like a <laughs> long time like I so I I used to be I used to write quite a bit um, I was in a relationship for a while where um, I would write and she fancied herself a writer but she was like one of those writers that never actually wrote and so because mm. self esteem stuff um, and then so I would like show her something that that I wrote and she'd be like oh I, I hate you oh I was, but more like worst. she'd be like. She'd be like, I hate you because I can't write like that. So I yeah. stopped showing her stuff, and then I stopped writing. Yeah, that, that sounds like <clears throat> how it would go. Yeah, and so uh, four years ago, uh, I heard about uh, uh, the first um, uh, Thousand Monkeys, and I was like, I'm going to do that because I really want to write. And I wrote this thing called uh, The Parliamentarians, which was about a, uh, a conservative prime minister uh, in a minority government celebrating being elected at the, chat, the, the Chateau Laurier with his favorite call girl uh, and uh, her mother, the leader of the opposition. Um, Do you recall your three words? Oh, you know, I. so the three words, there was uh, popular, uh, mole, as in a gangster's girlfriend, and, uh, oh, I don't even remember the third one. I don't remember the third one. Um, and but it was popular that was the sticking point for me. I think I sat for like an hour and a half mulling over the word popular because I was like, oh, I don't want to write a high school story. <laughs> um, and suddenly as I was looking, I like I always bring like I load up my phone with like dictionary apps for for Thousand Monkeys so that when I get those three words, I can look up different interpretations of that oh, word, and different different things. And I stumbled across popular opinion. Ah. Uh, the third word was horde. Horde. Horde, as in a horde of something. And I took it as, once I got popular opinion, that became political. And then I knew that a horde, what could be a horde? A horde of reporters. Mm, cool. Which was what that was. So during the action, there is a horde of reporters outside the hotel who know that the prime minister is inside. Neat. And so you, I mean, uh, you were, you played the, uh, the prime minister's uh, wife, Vera, it was our, very fun. It, I Vera was was uh, I, I wrote Vera to once I introduced the character of Vera because I knew that he had a wife and we talked about her uh, and she was like I think I named her Vera because when I first started writing she was like uh, in Cheers Norm's wife Vera who you never <laughs> saw but she would like call and stuff I like that callback <clears throat> that's fun. <clears throat> and uh, so she wasn't on stage. And then I was like, you know what? I, I think she's got to come in. And so I was like, okay, so who's Vera? Well, he's afraid of her, so she's a terror. And so I wrote somebody who terrified everybody. And, and she was a joy to play. Well, you're, you're <laughs> welcome. You're yeah. welcome. I mean, I'm actually in the process of rewriting the second half of The Parliamentarians. Man, that blows my mind. I have never rewritten something. I have, I have worked it. I have massaged it, but I have not. What you have done, where you've you've done um, a playwriting workshop, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term, of that awesome incubator, 
Um, you've gone through the rehearsal process, yeah. taken notes from actors, yeah. taken notes from a director, um, and 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 put it up mm-hmm. in front of an audience yeah. that enjoyed it. Yeah. And now you're rewriting it. Yeah. Well, why and how? Okay. So here's here's why. So the first half of the play took place, you know, on this this night. I guess it was a Friday night or whatever. And then at the end of the first half, when there was, you know, we we learn at the end of the second half that um, the call girl is the leader of the opposition's daughter. Block out, and then I would I fast forwarded six months, mm. and. I, in retrospect, after seeing it, I felt like what the audience really wanted to see, Hmm. and I think that I robbed them of, was the opportunity to see the fallout of that reveal. Because I think that that play, that first act ends and the audience is like, oh, what's going to happen next? And I went, yoink, not going to know. Yeah, yeah, you took away the juice. I took away the juice. And I, I think that a lot of that had to do with, um, I'm not a per, I'm not a person who like enjoys conflict. Mm. And so, um, the idea of writing all of these people, like the conflict that was there, uh, was something that made me uncomfortable. So I took the easy route mm-hmm. and went down a road where the conflict had basically been resolved. Interesting. And so I've been trying to rework that. With uh, that, the 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 minute sixty seconds after that reveal. Wow! Amazing. Yeah. That is kind of amazing. In the it, other than the fact that you're like, okay, yeah, that that happened, but I think it can be better. Yeah. Which also blows my mind. But also the fact that you're putting yourself in a situation that you know is going to make you feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Yep. To better your work. Yeah, absolutely. Like, standing ovation, my friend. Well, thank you. Like, that's thank you. that's hard. <laughs> that's very you know, hard. It is hard. And it's hard. I know it's hard because I've been working on that on and off for about six months. Hmm. And when I say on and off, I mean, I wrote for a weekend in May. And then I, you know, wrote a little bit in September and then like I haven't really it's hard to really go at it full steam because it is a place that makes you uncomfortable it is it's definitely that and you know what when there's also I've I've realized something about myself as a writer is that um, I don't I don't like to finish things interesting (laughs) and and I'm I'm catching myself on that where um, I will find so you know I'll get it to a certain point I'll be like okay that's fine but it can I can do more it's not finished yet oh but there's here's a new idea and so I'll work on that so that I don't have to finish this thing. And I think Ooh. I don't have to finish this thing because if it's finished, then I have to decide what to do with it. Oh, sneaky. And then, yeah. you know, so if I don't finish it, I never have to, I never have to face that. But I know that about myself. So I'm, I'm, as I catch myself being like, oh, I'm going to work on this thing. I'm pulling myself back to... Like, no, go back no, to the parliamentarians. To this thing. I haven't gone back to parliamentarians yet. But that's, that is one of the things that I, I know I have to do. It's got to be, it's got to be... Within the next month or so, something that I have to, I have to do. So, do you not ever have one project on the go? Or are you one of those people that needs to have like five tabs open on their on their browser? I usually have oh, uh, at least five tabs on my browser. <laughs> and you know, I have my idea file um, that I have on my phone. So, whenever I get an idea, I I write stuff down. Um, whether regardless of, of what it is, like sometimes it's a snippet of a conversation, and I'm trying to. I look back and I'm like. So what did this mean? Like this this phrase here, which I've not find it, found a, a use for yet. Okay. But f- I don't remember how I how I came across how I came up with this. But it was like I was thinking about thinking about it, and then I thought, yeah, I'm thinking <laughs> about it, and I don't know what to do with it. But I'm so I love it's begging that, to be said by a character, begging to be said by somebody, and I don't know who. But one day, yeah, well, one day, one day. That's really yeah. amazing. So I've got like, and I'm not at a, the, I think my problem is that I'm not at a loss for ideas. Which and every idea, great. the downside to it is that every idea is begging to be written. Mm-hmm. And the new is always more attractive yeah, it's shiny. than revisions, yeah, yeah. which are hard. Because revisions are difficult. You have to, like, it's work. 
It is. The creating the first time, writing that first draft, that's fun. You're yeah. learning what it's the story cathartic. is. You're getting you're, it out. Exactly. And you're learning what the who are these characters? What's this story? But then revision is to make it good. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's not sexy and that's not that's hence hard. I've never <laughs> done it. I mean I've I've taken notes and I've like again like massaged and mm-hmm. you know, oh it sounds better if you say they instead of them or yeah. like the very superficial kinds of things. Yeah. Um, I also believe that once the, the script hits rehearsal, as long as the team is comfortable and as long as like the playwright is in the room, sure, let's let's bring in improv moments. Like yeah. you're you're gonna start to live and breathe these characters. You might, you know, find that uh, the way that I phrased it as the playwright doesn't necessarily come out of your mouth that, yeah. the same way. Yeah. I'm cool with that. But what you're saying is, is like, you've taken the sword into battle, mm-hmm. and now you're like, you know what? The sword should be two axes. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. <clears throat> like and that's all, like, well, like, I mean, yeah, in a good way, but like also, I can't, I can't even, what I'm trying to say is I'm fangirling the fact that you... You have the energy and you have the focus to be like, no, no, this could be forged better. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the thing is that, is that, you know, we don't workshop very much in Canada. Mm. Um, Maybe that's why it's also very foreign. Yeah, I mean, there are workshops and they do happen. But if you look at a show that goes on Broadway, it's been workshopped like over years. Right? Um so, like, you look at Hamilton, you look at the Book of Mormon, and those plays were workshopped over a period of years. Yeah. Which means that these actors came in, and they worked on it, they gave their feedback, they performed it. And then then the, the, the writer went back and did a revision on it, and, like, wrote something new. And so it was was made better. I I sometimes feel like, because we don't really do that so much in Canada, we go... All right, so I'm the playwright, and I write, um, I've got, uh, so first draft, second draft, third draft, good enough, we're done. Yeah. And I, I think, in a way, we're, we're sort of like, we're not taking anything away from the work, but sometimes I think it could be better. Like, I love, when I write something, I want to have people come in and read it like almost right away. I want to get a group of actors together, read it and then have them talk about as they've inhabited that character, like um, talk about what worked, what didn't work. And I can disagree with them, but I can also like take what they said and, 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 and pull it apart. Also an amazing statement. I think uh, like one of the things that I like about writing for theater is the collaborative nature. Mm-hmm. Like, I've often thought, oh, I would love to have a novel pu- published. And then when I sit down to write a novel, I'm like, that's so much work. <laughs> it's like, very I gotta, isolating, I, I have think. to describe everything. <laughs> and I, I like concentrating on the dialogue and the story and let somebody else worry about how the character's going to look, how they're going to say it, yeah. how are they going to move. Like, let somebody else take that. And so um, I like to leave holes that an on, actor and a director purpose. can fill. Yeah. Which is also a great gift because, I mean, let's love Ibsen. Let's love them. Mm-hmm. But they're like three pages of stage directions. Tennessee Williams is right? well. like, like, like I don't, I don't need those directions. I don't need all that. Cause, you but know, what, for when him, I, I, he needed it to write it. Of course, yeah. But as an actor, <clears throat> I was told right away, like, forget take all the that stage stuff directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when I write stage directions, I just want to give you a suggestion. Well, that's nice. Right? Just what you need. Yeah. Like if if you need to know something to make this work, then that's what I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to like describe everything because yeah. I feel like then I'm taking away your like uh, our journey, like as your an journey. Actor. Yeah. Yeah. I'm taking away your job. You're like this is like, yeah. you, need to, you need to come up with this stuff, and it'll be more fun for you, better for you, and a better performance if you come up with this stuff. I agree. I'm I'm definitely mm-hmm. of the ilk that I would rather like. I'm, I'm not as bad as Christopher Walken. I've been told that he takes all punctuation out, mm. that he doesn't want to see the script with any punctuation. Yeah. Uh, and and that he will form the thought yeah. as he sees fit. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm that hardcore, uh, but I definitely appreciate not being told she laughs. Yeah, yeah. She cries. Or, or, you know, she hugs them or whatever. And it's like, 
I understand that you might need that again, Tennessee mm-hmm. Williams. You might need to write that down to get your position across mm-hmm. and like make context. But yeah, at the end of the day, give the mm-hmm. gift over and let it blossom with the actor. I mean, I'll say things like she laughs, but I mean, if the I if the actor decided that they didn't like that they didn't need to laugh, I would not be offended by that. Interesting. Okay. You know, it's a suggestion of how I see it. Mm-hmm. But then the the whole performance is still something for the actor to come up with. Good. I like that. <clears throat> that that's that's very good. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. I agree. Um, okay. And then just let's let's also just touch on uh, some of the stuff that that you have been excited to work on as an actor. Mm. Well, I mean, the thing is that, like, as an actor, um, I I've mostly been a self a self creator. For a while, like through Keystone Theater and stuff like that, um, and you know, I love the work that Keystone does, and I have believed in it from the beginning as a as a as an <clears throat> as a as an art form and an interesting theatrical um, uh, exercise um, to create a story that has no spoken word. Um, and to, to like to tell that story and to invent to sort of like uh, play with that whole Chaplin and Buster Keaton esque thing, um, and that's been a lot of the work that I've done in recent years. I don't really audition for stuff much anymore. Mm. Um, occasionally, something might come up, and I think like maybe I want to do that, like some Shakespeare or whatever, because I can always bust out a couple of Shakespeare monologues for an audition. Amazing. Um, and I'm probably getting too old for some of the monologues that I've held dear for what? some. Like I think I think I think I might be getting too old for Wild Abandon for Daniel McIver's Wild Abandon. I think Daniel McIver will hear this and he will say no. Well, I don't you know because do I think that Daniel. I mean, that, the character in, in Wild Abandon is is definitely a younger person. The things that he goes through are a younger person's uh, uh, traumas All right, and, fair and insecurities. So I probably have to have to find something new, but it's such a good. It's such a good, like, there's so much good material there. And it's one of those ones, because most people who are not, like, most people who uh, find their monologues by picking up a monologue book, a Ugh, lot of people do. You're not, no, that's not allowed. That's not allowed anymore. <clears throat> oh, then, like, I see, I see that all the time. Oh, no, don't. And, no, and, it hurts. Um, so they don't come up with Canadian monologues very often. Um, and so you could be, like, the guy who walks into the room with a monologue that they haven't heard yet, which is always, which is always good. But again, uh, that bit from Wild Abandon, it's such a great bit. Um, you have that, to reread that then. Uh, well, it's, I mean, there, it, there are some speeches in it that are just amazing, mm. but there's a, a bit about the, the, the diner. There's a scene in the diner that's a whole speech, which is just a great, a great uh, uh, audition piece. Mm. But, you know, it was, it was Daniel McIver that made me want to do a solo play in, in the first place. Like, me too! Right. <laughs> I mean, Sandra Seamus. Oh my God! Let's bow down to our Canadian people. Right? Yeah. So I like I had. I don't think I had really seen the idea of, of a solo show until I read Wild Abandon. Wow. And I read it, and I was like, "This is amazing." And then I read House, and I went, "That's amazing." Right. Right. Like you can like fill like this time with just like a single person. Oh, the things that he does with very simple lighting cues. Yeah. Like a very tight red box, mm. and I was completely enthralled with the fact that all I could see with his, was his head, mm-hmm. and it's and it's just a light effect. Yeah, and it's like what what makes this so? I mean, other than the I mean, fact, the fact that, that he's like a it's an, Daniel Frickin McIver. He, I mean, he's such a such, I mean, I'm I'm gonna fanboy over this. Too, I'm already I mean, there, right? Because <laughs> I mean, he's a, like he's a, an engaging performer that as soon as he walks on stage, he's magnetic. Mm. His words are just incredible mm-hmm. to speak. And when he shifts in characters, when he shifts from character to character, he does it so it's seemingly so effortlessly. And you know, I've seen people do solo shows where they're playing multiple characters, and it takes them so long to switch characters. Yeah. That I'm like, just do it, do just it, do it, just do it. And he just does it. Yeah. I mean, it also it also begs that like us going back to that idea of of workshopping and really getting like mm-hmm, taking mm-hmm. the notes criticizing your own work, working with people that you respect their opinion, going back to the drawing board yeah. and like this these years yeah. that we don't talk about. Like we don't talk about 
how that that new thing that's at Soul Pepper took years, mm-hmm. or you know the thing that just got the touring grant took years, mm-hmm. and the fact that Daniel McIver is that good, yeah, because he knows, yeah, he knows now, yeah. he knows who to work with, yeah, who to bounce ideas off of, yeah. He, you know, he knows his reflection in the mirror and to be like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. All I need right now is a close up on my face. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's craft, mm-hmm. but also putting in the time yeah, that absolutely. we don't talk about. Um, have, you haven't read uh, Jordan Tannehill's uh, uh, Theater of the Unimpressed? Yes. I, I think you forwarded it to me. I don't know if I did. I don't know if I did. It's a whole book. So, I mean, it's one of those things where it talks about, you know, I mean, basically, the crux of his of, of that book is why don't people go to theater? Well, it's, yeah, it's a great question. It is. It's like the question. Um, but I mean, a lot of the stuff that he's talking about, like one of the things that he sort of uh, uh, derides in that book is what he calls the well-made play. Mm. The well-made play, whether it's like a, a you know a, a city room piece or like a kitchen piece or whatever it is. And everybody comes in and they set up their particular problem. And by the, we know that by the end of the play, that problem is going to be resolved. Hmm. And in fact, sometimes when you're watching the play, you can see, oh, that's how it's going to be resolved. There's the bow on that And I storyline. wonder sometimes if, if that has become the norm. I don't know about anywhere else, but, but here. Because we don't workshop or we're not. I mean, there is certainly a, a desire to like tie a bow on everything. Hmm. But... That's sort of, I think, in a way, a bit of a disservice to the audience to 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 um, uh, to coddle them mm-hmm. instead of like making them do some brain work. Um, but and I, you know, I have so many issues. Like, I'm on my third reading of Theater of the Unimpressed, and I still don't know what I think about it. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to um, read this. And, and it's it's one of those um, like I think he's got a lot of great ideas, and uh, I've. Like, I'm so interested in all the things that he's saying. I just don't know if I agree with all of it. Right. Um, but I definitely think that he's got a point on on, on, term, on the well-made play. Um, because I think that after a while of seeing, like, everything with a bow on it... No, I can't that we're, it. we're kind of like... I think our audiences are a little bit bored by that. I understand that there there was a time, not, not just in theater, but also uh, in TV and movies, that we needed escapism and we needed things to end up with a bow. Because yep. there's a lot of anxiety happening in the world. Mm-hmm. That's not to say that we don't need that now, no. because there's mm-hmm. other things that are happening in yeah. the world right now. Um, but I feel like... Oh, I have it on my bookshelf, and I'm, because we're here, yep. I look on my bookshelf. Yep. I think it's here. Um, but that... There's been some fantastic works that have made it a point not to put the bow. And that it's social commentary. Like, we're going back to theater as an incubator of, uh, like, a think tank. Yeah. For you well, to walk out with that experience. It's like that, that thing where, you know, you're, you're making, instead of, like, telling the audience that everybody's going to be okay, make them do the work a little bit so that they, so that they're able to come up with their own conclusion. Like one of the things that, that has always been fascinating to me about performing with Keystone Theatre is because we don't have words, we can't tell people all the things that are happening in the story. Hmm. So the audience draws their own, they, they fill in the blanks of what they understand. They enjoy the story, but they sort of just fill in any of the blanks that they find. And I am always fascinated with... with um, what they've come up with. We know what we think the story is, but I'm always yeah. fascinated with what they do. And they're not wrong. No. Because that's what they took away from it. But it's always fascinating to see you saw the same show that we put on, and you saw the same show, and you guys think a, Completely a little bit different thing about these different moments. Yeah. And that's fascinating to me. And I think that people enjoy having to, like, coming up with their own their own answer like they have their understanding yeah you know and that's fascinating well I mean and that's also I think a big reason why people still go to the theater is that movies and television show you where to look and when to look Mm -hmm. and you like the 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 lens has been curated yeah and in theater you have this whole expansive space on stage and in the audience like it depends right Mm -hmm. like what show you're you're watching um, that it can happen at any time all around you and where are you looking? What story are you following? Yeah. What did you miss? Well, it's interesting because I think in a lot of cases, 
you know, when we're putting stuff on stage, we worry a lot about where the audience is looking, how to draw their eye. For sure. And that's fine. But, you know, sometimes what I see in some, in some productions is we draw the eye, everybody look over here and don't do anything. Yeah. Everybody stand very still so you're not drawing attention. But you know what's fascinating? I saw uh, a show, um, my friend uh, uh, Haley did a show in, in Hamilton this year called the Teeny Tiny Music Show, which was like this, uh, it was almost like a happening. It was like thing musicians would just appear out of nowhere and like if you were looking over here you might see something different than was over there it didn't draw your eyes so much as like give you candy (laughs) um wherever you were looking so like occasionally they would like draw your eye but you could look over there and there'd be something fascinating you can look over there and there's something fascinating and if you go more than once you're going to see different things and that was so exhilarating Mm. to be able to be in a space and like know that there's some candy for me wherever I look. Yeah. There's always a reward. <clears throat> yeah. 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 And and not to get out of the, the, the Canadian inspiration, but things like immersive and exper- experience. Yeah, yeah. Experience. Uh, what is the word? Experiential. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, theater like Sleep No More. Yeah. And like site-specific mm-hmm. becoming more and more popular to get well, out of the black box. Well, Hogtown in Toronto, for example. Very cool. And, uh... Um, uh, I would almost call, like, we saw that production of Measure for Measure just this past week. Mm-hmm. I would almost, that was almost, uh, it verged on the, uh, <clears throat> on the, how, the experiential. Because of how intimate the actual theater was. Because of how intimate the, the theater was and how close the actors were. Yeah. And they didn't shy away from that. Like, at one point, there were, like, actors practically sitting in our laps. Well, there definitely were. Uh, and... You know that was there was something exhilarating about that about that lack of a fourth wall yeah. that the space forced you into. Yeah, I um, because I'm biased. I, I'll I'll bring up Eldritch Theater as mm-hmm. well. And oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The fact that they specifically make <clears throat> their shows to be in a very small, intimate venue because they want that intimacy. They want that to be a part of the story. Absolutely, absolutely. And that we are no longer. Because everything, everything has its time and place. We, we, you know, like big grand show, show lines and, and whatnot and uh, Mervis shows mm-hmm. and whatnot are fantastic. And, but I also like that there's enough room and space to have also these very intimate, very, um, like to, to have an experiment yeah. that everything, again, the well may play yeah. doesn't necessarily need to be every single experience. Exactly. I really love the, I mean, in Toronto, and I, I can only really speak about the theater scene in Toronto and, and the, the storefront theaters like the storefront theater and the Red Sand Castle ah, like these these theaters in spaces that are not really traditional spaces yeah like not being Persinia able, March Persin- and whatnot like, and you can configure them to be pretty much any space like anything you need them to be yeah and the, the and also they're more affordable yeah. than um, the spaces that we like you I, who can afford a, to rent a Mervish space as well, and you know, I've I've done shows where we've rented like uh, a can stage space or a Passamari space or a, or a Tarragon space, and who can afford those? But to be able to do indie theater in an indie space and to be able to do something really, really like interesting with it. Do you think that that's our equivalent of off Broadway? Like, what do we have that? We don't have that because you know the thing about about Broadway is that there's a bunch of theaters run by different different people and there might be a couple of, of houses that are, are uh, uh, run by a, the same company but there's also um, <clears throat> there's so many of them mm-hmm. and Broadway is not like I always thought that Broadway was like an area mm. and it is but there isn't like while Broadway is a street the theaters are not even on that street mm-hmm. um, and Broadway is a house size and off Broadway is a smaller house size and off off Broadway is like a, a smaller, smaller size. <laughs> but we in Toronto have we have Mervish and then everything else and then everything else. <laughs> well, we have Mervish <laughs> and then we have uh, Factory Passmerai and Tarragon, which are uh, like Upper. wild. Well, they're well, I would call them mid. Interesting. And we then we have indie. Yeah. And indie theater happens like Unit One Hundred Two, which just cl- which closed. And the storefront and the Red Sandcastle. Yeah. So we don't really have a Broadway. No. So we can't have an off-Broadway. Do you think, like, that the, the Fringe Festivals take that off-Broadway feel? Um, 
I think that the fringe festivals take that the indie feel. Mm. Because, you know, one thing about, about Fringe, and, and anybody who's listened to the podcast knows that I love Fringe. Hmm. Um, and I love, even the fact that I didn't get into Fringe this year, I love the lottery system. Hmm. Because I find, I think that that makes things so fucking interesting. Yeah. Like, it's not curated. So anybody who, who wants to create a thing can has the same chance as anybody else yeah. to get their thing done. And... Uh, so it's like complete, it's the complete anarchy of the indie spirit is fringe. Cool. Um, but the level above that is, I don't, I guess, I mean, you would hope that everybody wants to be the next Kim's convenience hmm. to have a show that Soul Pepper or Mervis says, come do your show on our stage and can mm-hmm. go on to do something else. And it means even more now that they got picked up for, for TV. TV. Yeah. But I mean. I mean, everybody wants that. I mean, mm-hmm. you could you could always hope to be the drowsy chaperone and yeah. go to Broadway, but um, I I often wish that there were more. I mean, you've got you've got Fringe and you've got SummerWorks, um, and I always like SummerWorks is that thing that as an idea I like, but when it, uh, for a curated festival, I often I'm all, like there's a part of me that that sort of rebels against the idea of somebody saying this is is what I think is theater that's good enough to be in this indie festival Um, because I feel like when that I feel like you know I'm I'm thinking about applying to summer works and this may shoot me in the fucking foot but I don't fucking care (laughs) Um, I feel sometimes like the choices that are made are because the proposal says this is important theater Mm. and I'm bored by important theater. Right. Like, if the theater has to tell me how important it is, I'm bored. Yeah. Like, be important. Don't curate my thoughts. But don't curate my thoughts. Like, and I always feel like yeah. like that is... I I often feel like... I don't want to say always. I often feel like that is what SummerWorks is. Is this is important theater. And so, um, I guess the, 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 the place I'm going with that is that in terms of festivals for theater... Like, what are your options if not Fringe and if not uh, uh, um, Summer Works? Yeah, those are those, those are your options. Other, either than that, or you have to like either get a storefront interested to CoPro or to rent the space or Red Sandcastle. Yeah, which is fine. Yeah, some people do. Some people do, yeah. and I mean that's and you know Red Sandcastle. I fucking love that space, um, but um, I often. I think that the barrier is this idea that we are, um, like, how do I get people to see my show? It's that audience question, right? Always. And how do I afford the thing? Yeah. And God, I, I I always, I, I've been feeling for a while, like, the thing that's, that's kind of missing for indie theater is the idea that, that, that um, it's like we have our audiences and we sit down and we say, we sort of coddle it, like, we hold on to it like I'm holding this dog right now. <laughs> um, that is, um, oh, this is my audience, and you. This is I am keeping my audience, and I keep them close, and I don't want to share them. Right? Yeah. And the idea that that if if my audience, if you get a hold of my audience, and my audience goes away, it doesn't work. Like I don't that. think it works that way. I think, and I firmly believe, and this is something that uh, uh, when I was in Montreal with with Keystone Theater. Uh, Cameron and oh, I'm a horrible person for not remembering Cameron's last name. Cameron Moore, um, she does this uh, talk on you know promoting at theater and the thing promoting Fringe, and she always says that there's audience enough for everyone, and mm-hmm. I believe that absolutely. I I really I kind of wish that there was like this umbrella promotion thing so that like I can get my mailing list and my followers to you, and you get your followers to me, and like we pool our audience and so we reach a larger audience yeah. by doing that instead of like holding on to our tiny little audience oh, afraid the that they're going to abandon us. Thing. It's and it's proven that if especially in a festival situation mm. people do not go to see one show. No. But even outside of a, a, a festival situation like if I'm producing a show my audience the people that come to my show are just as likely to go and see your show. Absolutely. Because people who go to see theater are just looking to see good theater. Amen. They're not necessarily just looking to see... They don't... Like, the idea that they will only come to my show and if I give them... If you take them, they're not going to come back to my show 
is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I think, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is because I really, I really think there needs to be some kind of um, audience share. Yeah. Like, it, I don't know, the, 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 the car share of audiences. That would be so cool. The zip car of audiences where <laughs> whatever it is, where, where somehow we, there's like a, a, a promotional pool and everybody shares everybody's information with everybody. Yeah. And if your pitch is good, my audience will go, but they like my work, so they're still going to come and see my work. Yeah, yeah, amen. Um, on that note, <laughs> uh, I think uh, we should wrap this baby up. All right, well, Thank, thank you for, for inter- interviewing me today. Thank you for coming on Stage Worthy Podcast, Phil. <laughs> Stage <Stay laughs> Worthy.